any work on the Lisbon earthquake must, by necessity, focus at least in part on the city of Lisbon. Number one, because of that city's proximity to the earthquake's epicenter. Two, because Lisbon suffered more damage in the disaster than in any other metropolis. And three, uh, because of the profound effect that the earthquake had in the political and economic life of Portugal. Yet the Lisbon earthquake's historical importance is also, and I would say largely, a reflection of its wide ranging influence across the Western world. It was without exaggeration, one of the most impactful natural disasters in history. And so therefore it's not particularly surprising that there is a very interesting Russian angle to the story. An aspect of the history that had barely been discussed or written about in English or in Russian uh, before I began researching my book. Now, before we talk about Russia, uh, I'd like to give you a little overview of the earthquake disaster itself. Seismologically, uh, it all began a little before 9.45 a.m. morning, Lisbon time, when a long dormant fault line several hundred miles off the Portuguese coast suddenly exploded across a vast gash in the ocean floor, perhaps as long as 600 kilometers. Driving upwards like a coiled spring, the energy release was staggering, the equivalent of 475 megatons of TNT, or approximately 32,000 Hiroshima bombs. The Lisbon earthquake was, we think, nine times more powerful than Tsar Bomba, the largest thermonuclear device ever detonated by the Soviet Union in 1961. It was at least three times more powerful than the volcanic eruption of Krakatoa in 1883, and a thousand times more potent than the devastating Haitian earthquake of 2010. Many of you may remember that. Uh, earthquake uh, in which about 200,000 people perished. Estimated by seismologists to have measured at least 8.5 and possibly above 9.1 on the moment magnitude scale, which is essentially the Richter scale. Uh, it was unquestionably one of the most powerful earthquakes in human history, the largest ever recorded in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and as far as we know, the most powerful to strike the continent of Europe in recorded human history. That means the last 5,000 or so years. Over the next eight to 10 minutes, the false hanging wall, as it's called, would surge upwards two more times, a total of 10 meters from the seabed, each tremor radiating outward, as you sort of see here in this slide, from the quake's hypocenter at three to five kilometers per second. Now this slide shows the approximate uh, hypocenter, epicenter of the earthquake. We don't actually know where the earthquake originated. There's a number of faults that uh, seismologists have located that may have been, but there's no, there's no agreement among geologists uh, on which fault it was. It's kind of very important to know uh, because almost certainly an earthquake of this size will recur, uh, perhaps in 5,000 5, years. The larger the earthquake, the, the less often uh, that they recur, thankfully. Now, um, the efficient cause uh, of the Lisbon earthquake was the movement of two, plate, uh, two plates, the Eurasian plate there in, uh, in, uh, in the north and the African plate uh, there in the south. The Eurasian plate, as you see, is moving southward and slightly westward. It's kind of turning. And the African plate is moving northward, uh, uh, turning off a uh, point off the African coast. These two plates, therefore, are smashing into each other um, at, a, at a rate of about or a speed of about one or two millimeters a year. But along that plate border, uh, enormous energies, uh, energy is being. Um, uh, is, is being built up and, uh, and cracks occur along this, uh, this area called faults. And if enough energy uh, and the right displacement of the plate uh, uh, occurs, one, fi one, one finds an earthquake. Um, 
And here's a map showing Lisbon here, the Iberian Peninsula, Africa, and all these little dots are actually earthquakes along this plate border. And here's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, et cetera. Now, this was a, a big earthquake, uh, as I've demonstrated and shown, uh, but tremors were reported as far away as Sweden, Norway, Ireland, uh, northern, uh, northern Italy, uh, Cape Verde, which uh, is uh, in the center of the Atlantic, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, in the southern Atlantic off Africa, and the Azores, which is in the uh, central Atlantic, but not, as far as data shows, Russia. And so thus, this earthquake was probably what uh, seismologists call a multi-earthquake event, where an initial earthquake triggers other faults, causing other earthquakes, kind of cascading uh, effect. In Venice, over 1,200 miles from the epicenter, uh, the 29, a 29-year-old Casanova, imprisoned for impiety in the depths of the Doge's palace, lost his balance during a tremor and saw the ceiling beam in his jail cell, and this we believe was the actual jail cell, suddenly turn on its axis, though not collapse as he had hoped. When the shaking returned, he would cheer it on with mounting excitement. Another, another great God, but stronger, he cried. Although delighted when many weeks later, he realized that he had experienced the shock that had flattened Lisbon, he was at the same time despondent that he had not been deposited quote, safe, sound, and free on the Piazza di San Marco. It was thus he wrote in his autobiography that I began to go mad. Another interesting thing about the Lisbon earthquake uh, is that it produced a tsunami. Uh, the epicenter, as I showed you, is in the Atlantic Ocean. And as this was a mega thrust earthquake shown here, uh, one of the, the faults the fault on the on the right in, in this diagram pushed upwards, displacing an enormous amount of water, but more importantly, energy, pushing it in various directions. And uh, this tele-tsunami, which is called a con which essentially a continent-wide tsunami, uh, as you can see, found its way to North America uh, and uh, the Caribbean, Canada, uh, it was felt uh, in Ireland, in Great Britain. It certainly smashed into the Iberian Peninsula and along Morocco, but it also went south uh, across the equator uh, and uh, was noted by people uh, in Pernambuco and Paraíba uh, in Brazil. Essentially, by the end of the day, November 1st, 1755, people drowned on all four continents around the Atlantic Ocean. Um, in terms of Lisbon, uh, the, uh, the tsunami came north. Uh, it went up the, the Tagus River and smashed into Lisbon's riverbank, where a lot of the survivors had gathered, uh, essentially escaping the falling buildings uh, of, the, uh, of, of the previous half hour. Uh, the earthquake destroyed a large section of Lisbon. Uh, this is the Carmo Church. Uh, where the uh, the roof essentially collapsed on parishioners. The earthquake occurring at 7.45 a.m. Uh, was the latter part of the 9 a.m. mass. Uh, and so it really occurred at the worst possible time. November 1st is All Saints Day uh, in the Roman Catholic calendar. And so people were either in mass or they were walking in the narrow streets of Lisbon uh, going to the 10 a.m. And those were probably the two worst places you could be in this kind of earthquake, in the narrow streets where things would fall on top of you, or in large buildings which tend to magnify tremors like churches. Uh, this is, of course, a photograph, a recent photograph, but this is what the Carmel Church looked like uh, before the earthquake. Um, and of course, as I've said, most of the damage and the greatest loss of life occurred in Lisbon. Uh, which was uh, the capital at the time of this vast Portuguese empire. In 1755, uh, Lisbon was no European backwater. Uh, it was the fifth most popular city in Europe after London, Paris, Naples, and Amsterdam. Uh, 
it was the third busiest port and it was the principal port for new world trade uh and you can see that the ships there uh in the tagus right at the center is the riverside palace uh which was filled with uh you know uh, objects from across the portuguese empire the Portuguese monarchy had a library that may have been the largest in the world, larger than the uh, the collections of the Bourbon family or even the Vatican uh, at the time. Uh, it was a library, and in fact, every was was completely destroyed uh, in the earthquake. Now, uh, Lisbon was also extraordinarily wealthy, uh, and the reason it was wealthy was that in the final years of the 17th century. The Portuguese found gold and diamonds uh, in their New World colony of Brazil. The Spanish had found uh, silver and gold and precious gems uh, several centuries before that, uh, becoming the, the richest country in the world. Um, but this new influx of money, specifically gold and diamonds, uh, into Lisbon, uh, made Lisbon, again, one of the richest cities in the world, and uh, it was actually believed that the Braganza family, which was the Portuguese royal family, might have been the wealthiest royal family in all of Europe, even wealthier than uh, the Bourbons. So this, this gold flowed into Lisbon, uh, and uh, it was used uh, to decorate churches and palaces uh, and and great uh, stately homes, many of which were completely destroyed uh, in the earthquake. This is from the uh, one of the churches that actually survived, the Jesuits Church, uh, Saint Roch. Uh, here is a, a carriage um, owned by the royal family. Uh, the monarch in the first half uh, of, of the 18th century, John V, João Quinto said, because of all this money coming in, from uh, Brazil, my grandfather owed and feared. I neither fear nor owe. And so Lisbon, on the eve of the earthquake, was known for two things. It's extraordinarily, extraordinary wealth. <laughs> for that reason, we had, you had Europeans, uh, in fact, the people, the merchants from all over the world uh, wanting to get sort of a piece of this, uh, uh, this wealth. Uh, and also for the Inquisition. Uh, which was still going on uh, in 1755. Um, it, it wasn't uh, as, uh, as, as common as it had been in previous centuries, but people were certainly being burned at the stake. Uh, you can see here next to that Riverside Palace in the Praça uh, da Ribeira, uh, uh, right by the palace, now called the Praça do Comércio. Now, despite the fact that Lisbon and St. Petersburg were separated by more than 2,000 miles, or 2,200 miles, the inhabitants of the Russian capital were, like most Europeans, intensely interested in news of this earthquake. And uh, evidence for this can be found in Russia's oldest and, in November of 1755, only newspaper, the St. Petersburg Gazette, or Vedomosti. Um, the first mention of the Lisbon earthquake in Russia appeared in this newspaper on December 5th in the Julian calendar, or December 16th in the Gregorian calendar, one and a half months after the disaster. Quote, more than half of the Portuguese capital collapsed, the paper declared, and within a few minutes, around 100,000 people were crushed, unquote. Now, in reality, no more than about 40,000 people were killed in the initial in earthquake and uh, in the months and weeks after the disaster, people dying of their wounds, uh, et cetera. Um, but although this 100,000 uh, figure is a clear exaggeration, uh, it's very common. It's a common uh, figure in the newspapers uh, at the time. And I know this because I've read most of them. Uh, chapter seven in my book is called The News Spreads, and it tells the story of how the news of the earthquake made its way from Lisbon. In fact, it was on horseback because the Secretary of State, the Count of Oeiras, who becomes the famous Marquis de Pombal, 
closed off the Tagus River. He was afraid that pirates or a foreign power uh, would enter the uh, the river and attack prostate Lisbon uh, at the time. So uh, a couple of riders on horseback carrying letters from uh, private citizens and ambassadors uh, left uh, a couple days after the earthquake, uh, galloping towards Madrid. Then several more horses went to Paris, uh, up to London, down to Vienna, Venice, etc., in Rome. So I, I I was able to chart in the newspapers of the time exactly when the news reached various capitals uh, in Europe. And so I started to wonder about, hey, well, when did it reach Russia? Uh, and I determined there was a newspaper uh, in Russia. Uh, and I located at the time, lots of things are digitized today, but I found a microfilm of the St. Petersburg Vedemosti at Stanford, uh, and a copy was sent to my university in South Orange, uh, New Jersey, uh, Seton Hall University. Uh, and I taught myself, I, I don't read Russian, uh, but I taught myself how to identify the words Lisbon, Portugal, an earthquake in Russian Cyrillic uh, and found articles that it seemed to have, you know, fit uh, the period of the time when I thought the news would have reached uh, the Russian capital. I made copies uh, and then I showed them uh, to my colleagues, uh, Dr. Nathaniel Knight, who gave a talk uh, a few weeks ago uh, online that you may have seen. Uh, and Maxim Matusevich, uh, both professors in my department uh, who read Russian, and they helped me uh, translate uh, these newspapers and, and other documents. So I thank them in my book, but I will thank them again publicly here. Um, one thing about the St. Petersburg Gazette or Vedomosti uh, that's interesting to me is that it was typical of many newspapers in the mid 18th century. Uh, it's about eight, eight pages long, and uh, it was published twice a week by the Russian Academy of Sciences. And it really follows a template that you see uh, in the Gazeta de Lisboa, that is the, the only Portuguese newspaper at the time, and, and, and newspapers in, in uh, Madrid, Vienna, etc. Um, most readers would have acquired it by subscription. Uh, my sense is that it wasn't really sold on street corners. Um, and it primarily focused on foreign news. There were articles on what was going on in Russia, uh, particularly focused on the doings of, or the location of the empress or the, 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 uh, the heads of uh, various ministries. Um, and, uh, like other newspapers, uh, it relied on correspondence across Europe. So a correspondent in London or a correspondent in Madrid would send news or word from what was going on in Great Britain or in Spain, uh, and it would be published uh, then, uh, not in any order of importance necessarily. It seems that it was it, it, the order in which it was kind of received um, from abroad. Uh, and so, the news was on monarchs, ministers of state, foreign ambassadors, military officers, uh, aristocrats, um, meetings of diplomats, religious holidays and festivals, and also the movement of troops and ships, which become increasingly important in 1755 into 1756, because this is the period in which we find a lead up to the Seven Years' War, uh, what we in the United States call the French and Indian War. And also, uh, there was an interest in strange natural phenomena, like earthquake tremors. Um, there were no headlines in these newspapers, by and large. There were no pictures or illustrations. Uh, the illustrations that we find of the earthquake are in a separate publications, you know, short, broad, broadsheets of a few pages. Um, and um, uh, one of the most remarkable articles, and I should say that what's interesting is that the, a lot of these newspapers, they're sharing articles. So I'm reading the same article in German and, or in Italian, uh, and 
they're sending these, the, you know, the same article around. But there are some unique articles that one doesn't see anywhere else. And I found several of them in the Russian newspapers. Uh, one of the most remarkable articles from a seismological perspective uh, from the St. Petersburg Vedomosti was an article uh, on December 26, Gregorian calendar 1755 from Naples. So uh, this correspondent states that around 9 a.m. on November 1st, 1755, when the Lisbon earthquake occurred, Mount Vesuvius, seen here, which is only seven miles or so from Naples, began to emit smoke, leading many residents of Naples to fear an earthquake. But by 10 o'clock, the smoke had stopped and the people rushed to the churches to thank God for saving. So this is not only fascinating, but as far as I know, an entirely unique account. Uh, and in fact, I, I discussed it with several seismologists uh, about whether there was a connection between the smoking of Mount Vesuvius and the Lisbon earthquake. Uh, and all said that there must have been, although it's not altogether clear uh, what it might have been. Uh, we know what causes earthquakes by and large, but there's still uh, a lot of mysteries uh, about them. You apparently can only penetrate so deeply uh, into the mantle. There's, there's areas that are, that, that are a little, uh, they're a little foggy, uh, in, according to these geologists. Now, indeed, the St. Petersburg Venice would continue to publish articles on the Lisbon earthquake, uh, mainly regarding the number of deaths, various eyewitness accounts, the damage to the city of Lisbon, uh, and also scientific explanations for the earthquake by non-Russian scientists. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. Um, all in all, there are about 40 articles uh, in 1756 were published on the earthquake. And so add to that several articles in 1755. In 1756, um, the St. Petersburg Vedomosti received some journalistic competition. Uh, in April 1756, Russia's second newspaper appeared, the Moscow Gazette or the Moscow Vedomosti, which was published by the newly founded Moscow University. And from the very start, it begins covering uh, the Lisbon earthquake extensively, like its rival in St. Petersburg, running articles, uh, in some cases, not found in any other European paper. Um, one such article uh, on April 30th, uh, 1756, which caught my eye, uh, claimed that the King of Portugal, seen here, Don Jose, was attempting to, quote, restore trust between England and France. Um, this is notable uh, because it occurred one month before the formal beginnings of the Seven Years' War. And, um, quote, said the article, it shows that the King had calmed down somewhat after the misfortune that happened in Lisbon. Uh, we know that the royal family had almost perished in the disaster, though they had survived, um, but that the king was so, uh, so shaken up by the experience that it's said that he never went for the rest of his life inside a building with a stone seal. Uh, and and uh, the, the old palace, uh, was never rebuilt. That Riverside Palace was never rebuilt. The, the new palace was built out of wood. Um, and uh, it's where he lived uh, the rest of his life. So this, this, this would support that. We don't know exactly, again, how he was uh, attempting to restore trust between England and France. Although, of course, he knew both ambassadors, the French ambassadors and Andrew Bashi. Uh, the English ambassador was a man named Castres, uh, but um, it would be interesting if, if, the, if, that, uh, if that bit of information ever surfaced. Uh, so throughout the spring and summer of 1756, both of Russia's newspapers kept Russian elites apprised of the developing post-earthquake situation in Portugal, as well as the events which would blossom into the Seven Years' War. Now, uh, I should note that 
you know, these that news goes in both directions. Uh, and there were correspondents in both St. Petersburg and Moscow who were sending articles to European newspapers. Uh, and here's an article uh, in, uh, well, actually, here's the article uh, in the Gazeta Gilishboa. Um, like Russia in late 1755, uh, Portugal only had one newspaper, this one. Uh, and in this article, um, it states that uh, the Count, Count Peter Ivanovich Shuvalov, seen here, uh, who was general in chief of the Empress's armies on July 17th, reviewed a regiment of infantry in St. Petersburg. And then afterwards here, uh, it says he distributed to the soldiers a large sum of money, beer, and uh, spirits. It could be brandy. I've, I've talked to uh, a few people about that, maybe not, but, uh, but the, the troops were happy. Now it's possible that uh, the Russian empress at the time, Elizaveta Petrovna, first learned of the disaster not from the St. Petersburg Vedomosti, but from her envoy, or essentially the word for ambassador in Great Britain, Prince Alexander Mikhailovich Golitsyn, who posted a letter on the, on the Lisbon earthquake from London on November 25th, uh, 1755. Uh, this is that letter, which I obtained a copy of, along with several others, from the Foreign Policy Archive of the Russian Empire, uh, which is part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Moscow. Now, Golitsyn, Golitsyn's letter was posted one day after the news of the disaster arrived in London. And in it, the ambassador informs the empress of the earthquake, which, quote, crushed many people, unquote. Uh, and caused considerable alarm in the British capital. He mentions that that was due to the large numbers of British merchants living in Lisbon at the time. Now, the author of this letter, the ambassador of the uh, Golitsyn, was um, an interesting man. Uh, he was both a diplomat and an art collector, scion of the younger branch of the esteemed Golitsyn family, uh, he had previously served as an envoy to the Dutch Republic, uh, while later, back in Russia, he would become vice chancellor and a member of Russia's Privy Council. Uh, it's said that Golitsyn played a role in the coup d'etat that toppled the Emperor Peter III, though he was never particularly close to Catherine the Great, who, as you know, or many of you know, became empress after Peter. Uh, Peter's death. And it should be mentioned, perhaps this is the most interesting thing about him, that in 1764, so nine years later, uh, he helped Catherine acquire paintings from the Prussian art dealer Johann Gotzkowski, which laid the foundation for the collections of the Hermitage Museum. Now, two days later, uh, Golitsyn wrote another letter which communicated to the Empress uh, that confirmation of the horrible event in Lisbon had arrived with the French mail. Uh, there were all kinds of rumors going on at the time, uh, probably about other events that either happened or didn't happen. So he thought it important to confirm that it had indeed occurred. Uh, he added that only 100,000 people had died in the disaster. Um, and unless this was a mistake, um, it's a really uncharacteristically low number. The early numbers in the newspaper accounts and in the eyewitness accounts tended to be on the high side. Uh, interestingly enough, the Portuguese government was giving out official numbers that were rather low. Uh, they wanted to lowball it because they feared that uh, people would sort of write off Lisbon, that uh, trade would dry up, and uh, and potentially uh, there might be a, an attack by pirates or you know, another another state. Uh, so so uh, whereas you know the rumors were pushing the numbers up, the official numbers were trying to push it 
much lower than probably actually was. Um, Gulitsa also states in the second letter accurately that the Spanish ambassador, a man named Count Pedalada, had died in the earthquake. In fact, as he was running out of the front door of his palace, uh, instead, his, the coat of arms, which was above the door, fell on him and killed him. Um, he was probably, probably the most famous victim uh, of the Lisbon earthquake, uh, and is mentioned in almost all the accounts. Um, there's an endless discussion about what, hap what happened to his fatherless son, uh, how the king of Portugal gave him uh, a certain amount of money uh, sort of to live up sort of a pension to live off for the rest of his life. Uh, and uh, so that was one of the big dramas for people uh, in, in 1755 and 1756. Golitsa also mentions that four days after the earthquake, there was still thunder and shaking of the earth. Uh, and indeed, there were hundreds of tremors felt in Lisbon uh, in the year after the earthquake, about 500 uh, or so. Uh, these are every tremor, in fact, or aftershock, as they're sometimes called, is actually an earthquake in their own right. None of them were as powerful as the, uh, the main earthquake uh, on, in, on November 1st. But as you can imagine, uh, some of the larger ones really scared people, and it caused damage, brought down buildings that had been destabilized uh, by the earlier earthquake. Um, and uh, the thunder that he mentions, um, many, of, many larger earthquakes do make a noise uh, under the ground. Uh, so that's probably a, you know, an accurate description of these aftershocks. Um, it's curious that in this letter, Goditsen also mentions that fire was coming through the earth, as he puts it. And he adds that more than a week after the uh, disaster, um, the fire was still burning in the city. Uh, and uh, this was actually accurate. Uh, in fact, there are letters, the, 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 the best letters uh, in terms of act, I think come from the papal nuncio, which are in the Vatican library. Uh, and uh, they say that the, there were fires still burning in Lisbon six weeks after the disaster. He's also talking, I think, about the fire coming through the earth because many people at the time believed that earthquakes were caused by fires and explosions in underground caverns. And so the fire that people saw, they made a connection to these underground fires uh, that, of course, did not exist. Uh, that was, most earthquakes are caused by uh, movement of plates, as I mentioned. Um, but it's, it's interesting that it, it is, um, it's, it's, it's discussed. Now, to add, to discuss the fire, their the, the, the disaster was really three-pronged. There was an earthquake, there was the tsunami, and then there was a fire that became a firestorm. And this is uh, the claim that I'm, as a scholar, I'm the first person to make the claim that it was a firestorm, which is a fire that is so hot and so large that it draws in oxygen. It, it creates its own wind system, which allows it to survive, in this case, over a month. Um, and people actually uh, can asphyxiate uh, if they're even within 100 meters of a, of a firestorm. Uh, and so here is a, a German print which shows sort of a before and after of the, you know, of the earthquake's impact on Lisbon, the, the boiling waters of the Tagus, and of course the fires. Now this was, the firestorm uh, was a fire that was started by uh, fires in churches. Of course, the, the, the feast day mass was going on. Uh, the festival day mass was going on. Uh, the ceilings collapsed, roofs collapsed on top of candles. And also people were cooking meals for the, for the, for the feast day. And so ovens uh, ignited houses and these fires coalesced into a firestorm that uh, burned many buildings. Uh, and if you see here in orange, this is the central, if you've ever been to Lisbon, this low-lying area called the Baixa Pombolina, uh, which was completely burned out by the firestorm. And in fact, the firestorm did more damage to Lisbon than the earthquake itself, or even adding the, 
uh, the tsunami uh, to that. Another thing that Golitsyn mentions in his letter is that the Portuguese monarchs, José I, José I, Joseph I there on the left, and his wife, the Queen Mariana Victoria, were not heard of for 24 hours and were found without shelter or food. Uh, this is not quite accurate. Uh, it was some a rumor that you see in all the newspapers at the time. Uh, people were extremely apparently upset that a monarch could be alone uh, and without food or shelter for 24 hours. Um, he, he, he almost certainly was not alone for 24 hours. Uh, he did with his wife and their daughters escape their the palace uh stones falling around them um but um but this is a but, but this is a, a rumor uh how interesting uh he also mentions does Gulitsyn that uh the to the empress that uh fernando VI of spain seen on the left uh had sent the equivalent of fifty thousand pounds to portugal uh, as an aid package, along with clothing and other provisions, and that George II of Great Britain, seen there on the right, uh, had asked Parliament for a hundred thousand pounds worth of provisions to be sent to the Portuguese. According to Golitsyn, the Spanish offer of aid resulted in quote much praise for the Spanish king on account of his lofty sentiments and benevolence. And this is notable because Spain was not an ally of either Portugal or Great Britain, but Fernando uh, the sixth uh, was the brother of the Portuguese queen, Mariana Vitoria, and the Spanish queen was the sister of the Portuguese king, Don Jose. So there were, there were family connections, although the two countries were not allied. And this was, uh, important because this is the beginning of what became known as the, or what I call the first international aid effort. Uh, Britain ultimately sent about a dozen ships, perhaps more than a dozen ships, uh, filled with money and food and tools and shoes, uh, et cetera. Uh, and the free Hanseatic city of Hamburg sent four ships which were filled with boards and tools and food and a little cask of vine wine and another cask of honey for Joseph I, the king. Now, Spain's money and supplies were never delivered. Again, they were not an ally. There were treaty restrictions. So you couldn't even give textile or clothes to Portugal, even if they were a gift, because the British wouldn't allow it. Uh, and, and the money was kept in the embassy. So we don't actually we don't know whether the money was sent over, but maybe not be over. There are probably British objections going on here that we don't fully know about. Um, now it's possible that the Empress Elizabeth Petrovna desired to be similarly, similarly lauded as the Spanish and British monarchs. Or perhaps it was her well-known aversion to violence and bloodshed that led her to contemplate sending aid to Portugal. And uh, many of you may know that her popularity at the time rested on her decision, or largely on her decision, not to order any executions during her reign. Now, the evidence for the Empress's ultimately ill-fated plan to send relief to Russia are found in the writings of this man, Count Alexander Romanovich Vorontsov, who becomes chancellor of the Russian Empire later under Alexander I. According to Vorontsov, the 45-year-old empress, quote, had magnanimous intentions to send timber to be used for the rebuilding of Lisbon, along with iron and other materials, and a few thousand bags of flour, even though no formal diplomatic relationship existed between Russia and Portugal. According to Vorontsov, the proposed aid convoy would consist of a warship and several other vessels filled with supplies. It was to be led by a, quote, person of distinction, unquote, who would be responsible for personally conveying the empress's gift to the Portuguese monarchs. Now, it's not clear who this person of distinction would have been, uh, but we do know that Vorontsov, then only 14 years old, had been chosen to accompany uh, the mission 
Um, and we don't know who it was in his family, perhaps his father, Roman Borosov, who was Chamberlain and later Russian general in chief, or his uncle, uh, the diplomat Mikhail Borosov, uh, who saw in this journey a way for young Alexander to gain some valuable experience and see a bit of the world. Now, unfortunately for the teenage aristocrats uh, and uh, aspiring world traveler, the empress apparently changed her mind, uh, and this aid flotilla never left the dock. It's unclear uh, why this occurred. Uh, did the notoriously mercurial Elisabetta become distracted by the two abiding passions of her life, uh, French clothing and extravagant balls, or did she? Did she and her advisor sour on what would have been a diplomatically complex undertaking? Now, at the time, Europe was in political flux. And over the previous year, Russia and France had engaged in secret negotiations towards what would become a sweeping diplomatic rapprochement. And to facilitate these discussions, St. Petersburg had sent a shipment of exquisite sables to Louis the 15th, the king of, of France, uh, his mistress, none other than Madame de Pompadour. So they're sort of bribing Madame de Pompadour, who may have been the real power behind the throne. Uh, when word reached St. Petersburg of the Treaty of Westminster in January of 1756, which was a neutrality pact between Prussia and Great Britain, uh, the Empress's counselors encouraged her to end Russia's long-standing military arrangement with the British and ally Russia with Austria and France. And this is the beginning of the so-called, one of the most significant realignments in European history, the so-called diplomatic revolution of 1756, where the traditional alliance of Britain and Austria versus France and Russia was transformed almost in, overnight into uh, an alliance between Britain and Prussia. Uh, and we had Anne Han over there, which of course was close to the English crown. Uh, uh, Britain and Prussia versus France, Austria, and Russia. So no matter how horrified the Empress had been by the news from Lisbon, with such a realignment in the offing, Russia probably had little incentive to provide material assistance to Britain's close, long-standing ally, Portugal. Okay. Now, uh, Britain's relief efforts, on the other hand, were perfectly understandable. By aiding Portugal, Britain was providing a lifeline to a nation or a kingdom which uh, had which it had uh, substantial trading interests. Uh, as well as guaranteeing access to, to the strategic ports of Lisbon and Porto during the upcoming conflict. Uh, and I showed you that slide of the Tagus River and the Riverside Palace and the ships in the Tagus. A half of those ships would have been British. Uh, so the, uh, you know, the, the British were concerned for their citizens and they were concerned for their trade uh, going on in the future, the, the cushy trade deal that they had. And they were also uh, concerned. Uh, about those ports that were absolutely needed in the Seven Years' War, which was, uh, in, in many ways, a global war. Now, perhaps the most notable non-seismic aspect of the Lisbon earthquake was the great debate that it ignited sort of smack dab in the middle of the 18th century. And this debate was arguably the most significant of the European Enlightenment. Uh, because it engaged not only philosophers and professors, but in many ways, ordinary people in church pews and front parlors from Lima to St. Petersburg. Uh, and it was, in the fullest sense, a kind of a public event uh, involving a considerable proportion of the population of the Western world. There's a large sermon literature uh, that I'm basing a lot of this on. Uh, there, there, were, there were books published. There were uh, lectures given. There were scientific treatises produced, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the problem for the philosophes uh, was obvious. How could they square their faith in nature, this belief in natural rights and natural law, 
with this natural event, the earthquake, that had killed tens of thousands of innocent people. And uh, this debate uh, famously engaged uh, three of the most celebrated minds of the 18th century, Voltaire, Rousseau, and Immanuel Kant. Um, at its center, it was a rollicking debate about also about the physical causes of earthquakes and tsunamis. And uh, indeed, uh, Russia contributed uh, to this debate. Uh, Russia was fully informed about the leading theories uh, because uh, various pronouncements, various papers find their way in uh, the St. Petersburg Vedomosti in 1756. Uh, and uh, in fact, um, I'm just giving you an example. On January 12th, 1756, a certain scholar from Bern published uh, a letter uh, or a letter of, of his was published in the St. Petersburg Vedomosti in which he laid out his theory on what caused the Lisbon earthquake. Quote, Jupiter, Venus, and Mercury were on the equator in October. That, that Saturn was not far from there at that time, and moreover, the moon entered the equator on the same November 1st, the day of the earthquake, which bodies, together with the sun, were supposed to exert their action on the ocean, and this, in turn, through underground channels, was supposed to affect various places of the Earth's surface. Uh, and so he's putting forth a kind of novel theory. It wasn't the uh, the most popular theory at the time that the heavenly spheres were somehow affecting uh, and creating earthquakes. When I was a kid, tidal or tsunamis were called tidal waves, which isn't a particularly good uh, description because uh, tides don't have anything to do with with tsunamis. Um, then, um, in uh, a few days earlier or a few days later, I should say, in February 1756, uh, a Professor Holman from Göttingen um, lays out his theory for the causes of the earthquake in the St. Petersburg Vedomosti. And in it, he gives the popular position, which is that uh, great cavities under the earth containing combustible materials caused explosions. Uh, and he adds something very interesting that perhaps uh, measures could be taken to prevent such catastrophic events by drilling deep shafts to release the accumulating vapors. Uh, uh, and that's not, I haven't seen that before, um, but it's something that the, um, the Russians, at least those who were reading the St. Petersburg Mesti, would have, would have known about. Now, um, on September 6, 1757, uh, the renowned Russian polymath, uh, Mikhail uh, Loman, uh, Lomonosov, what is it, Anastasia, how do you pronounce it? Lomonosov. Lomonosov, thank you, uh, delivered a lecture to the Russian Academy of Sciences, published, uh, which published the St. Petersburg Vodomosti in St. Petersburg, entitled Discourse on the Formation of Metals from the Shaking of the Earth. Um, and in it, he theorized that earthquakes were caused by exploding deposits of subterranean salt. So essentially, he's, this shows us reading the literature from uh, European scientists on earthquakes. Um, it's very similar to the popular uh, theory. Uh, and uh, it is ingenious as it is wrong. Uh, what's interesting about this theory is that it's only a really a modification of Aristotle's 2000 year old view that earthquakes were caused by winds blowing through underground caverns. And so at least in, on the question of earthquakes, uh, even after the scientific revolution of the 17th century, scientists uh, in the West and in Russia uh, are, 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 are essentially giving an, uh, a theory that really hasn't branched off much from uh, the, the theory of over 2,000 years before. Now, of course, the true cause of earthquakes and tsunamis, uh, plate tectonics, which I talked a little bit about, was first accepted by the scientific community in the 1950s and 60s, 1950s and 60s. Uh, so uh, 
uh, our knowledge of what causes earthquakes is actually fairly recent. What was, however, groundbreaking um, in these speculations uh, in this lecture was that the Earth's surface was in a constant state of transformation and that it, quote, now has an appearance entirely different from how it was in ancient times. And um, this sort of was expanded in his later work on the strata of the Earth, published in uh, 1763, uh, seen here. So thus, um, thus, his theory articulates groundbreaking geological views partially influenced or inspired by the Lisbon earthquake more than two decades before the father of geology, James Hutton, made these same assertions in his theory of the earth uh, in 1788. Um, and so to conclude, uh, Russian reactions to the Lisbon earthquake, which are fascinating in their own right, reflect, I think, the commonality between Russia and the rest of Europe in the middle of the 18th century. A disaster occurring on the farthest western edge of the European continent elicited responses on Europe's eastern border that displayed, for better or for worse, uh, the Europeanness of Russian society and the Russian regime. Um, thank you very much. The first question is from Agnes. I guess you probably mentioned this in the beginning, but is Lisbon still considered a major earthquake danger? Uh, it is. Um, all of those fault lines uh, that I showed you in one of those earlier slides are still there. Um, and uh, the, the, the contemporary literature by geologists and seismologists, uh, and I read a, a lot of it when I was writing uh, those scientific sections of my early chapters, are, are focused on trying to figure out, you know, where that fault line is that caused uh, the Lisbon earthquake of 1755, because as I said, almost certainly it will recur, that that fault line will explode again. Uh, the larger the earthquake, the longer the, the Time period between erupt, you know, between um, earthquakes. Um, but yes, um, there was a fairly large earthquake in Lisbon in 1969, um, not as large as the Lisbon earthquake. Um, but you can just imagine if an earthquake that size occurred in the summer, uh, a tsunami would be hitting the Algarve, the southern part part of um, of Portugal, where you know it would only be about 10 minutes you would have before the earthquake uh, hit those beaches, which would be filled with, 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 with people. So it's, it, it's absolutely still an earthquake. Uh, there's still an earthquake danger to Lisbon and Portugal and Northern Morocco. Yes. Mm -hmm. There was also a question dedicated to the Empress and you mentioned that it's still um, pretty much unclear why she didn't end up sending this aid. So is it possible to somehow maybe do some additional research and figure it out? Is it possible that somewhere in the Russian archives there is more information so one day it will be all revealed and explained? I, I think that's very possible. Uh, it's, it's always possible with, uh, you know, with, with historical question. Um, you never know what is in the archive. Uh, you know, depending on depending on the archive, you never know what the next box will reveal. Uh, sometimes there's a description of a box, and you find other material at the bottom, things that you know have never been looked at by. Them. So um, uh, it's possible. It's also possible that those discussions were private between uh, the empress and her advisors, and uh, you know they probably did. It's possible they didn't want to put down on paper. Uh, the reasons specifically because because this diplomatic revolution was in flux, they didn't want to put down something on a piece of paper that might be read by someone else and then smuggled out and it caused cause an international incident. So um, yeah, I think there's a possibility, but there's also a possibility that um, nothing definitive uh, will be found as well. Mm -hmm. There is an interesting question from Denise. Um... Is there evidence that any foreign country contemplated seizing Portuguese territories, thinking that the country was in disarray and unable to respond? 
You know, that's a that's a good question. Um, and I can't definitively say no to that because again, there might be a there might be some some shred of information that either I don't know about or in the bottom of a box in an archive. Um, but number one, certainly there was no attempt uh, to attack Lisbon. Um, there were thieves that fell upon the city, um, but were they coming from outside the country? Not not really, um, because again, the, the the river was closed off. Um, no, there was no attempt by you know the Dutch to take the coast of Portugal. I mean, the coast of Brazil uh, at the time. Um, the, the Portuguese Secretary of State, a very able man, a very controversial man that I mentioned earlier, the Count of Oeiras, a man that's known to history by his later title, Pombal, uh, took really command of the country uh, in the, really the hours after the earthquake. As I mentioned, the, the, the Portuguese king was shaken by the experience, and he needed someone to start taking control, uh, and Pombal was that person. And so Pombal, um, you know, at least in Portugal, uh, he immediately mobilized the military, uh, found out, figured out where all the regiments were, sent some to the Algarve to, and sent some to the, um, to the uh, border with Spain and also sent some into Lisbon to stop the looting. Uh, and so he, he gave out to the, to, to the world uh, and to the Portuguese that, that, that Portugal was, um, you know, was was on a, on a knee on its knees, but it was still, uh, but it was not, you know, completely uh, impotent. Uh, and so, so as far as I know, no, there was no attempts to take any Portuguese territory in Asia or otherwise. Um, but it was certainly a concern of the Portuguese regime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Uh, Douglas Faulkner wonders: Has Russia and its empire historically experienced catastrophic earthquakes? As a person from St. Petersburg, I can say that there are definitely problem, problems with floods and wildfires somewhere in Siberia, but earthquake, probably not such a big problem, especially for the European part of Russia, right? Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not a specifically historian of Russia, uh, and I'm not a geologist or a seismologist. Uh, I can't, and of course, Russia is enormous. Uh, it's possible that they do experience some earthquakes in Central Asia. Um, it's possible on their their eastern fringes. Uh, there's even been a tsunami or two. That's most of the tsunamis are actually found in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the, the the Lisbon earthquake tsunami was very very rare. Um, but um, I I would have to say um, I don't know very much about it. Yeah, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. Can we say that in a certain way, the Lisbon earthquake shaped, um, in a certain way, again, shaped Russian and European intellectual thought? And speaking about Russia in particular, in what directions? You mentioned periodicals, you mentioned scientific articles. Can we somehow summarize it and just discuss it a little more? Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's in some ways the big question that hung over my book. Uh, and uh, I'm an intellectual historian, so I'm interested in ideas, and I'm interested in how ideas change. And uh, I, kind of, I guess I wanted to find that the earthquake um, represented an enormous break in European thinking and culture and ideas. Um, and I'm not sure I found that. What I found was a debate. And I found different groups of people using the earthquake to support the position that they already had previous to the earthquake. Uh, and so I did. I, I just mentioned Voltaire and, and Kant and, and Rousseau. But for example, uh, you know, Voltaire used the earthquake uh, to essentially rail against the injustices of the universe, the natural world, and the you know, the man-made world. Uh, and uh, he almost, he was, he was a believer, he attacked the church, but he did believe in God, um, but he almost was shaking his fist at God for allowing all of these innocent people in, in Lisbon to have died. Uh, and this was, this was an attitude that he had before the Lisbon earthquake, um, but the earthquake gave him what all writers need as a subject, right? And it gave him sort of the perfect subject to express these ideas, these these critical ideas about the world. Um, he was getting old, his previous mistress had died, and so he was kind of in a grumpy mood anyway, but 
he um, he wrote an he wrote a, an essay on the uh, on the earthquake that was widely distributed. And then several years later, uh, he writes a book that would almost certainly not have been written um, but for the earthquake's influence, and that is his masterpiece, Candide. Uh, and the earthquake had there's a, there's an appearance, there's a cameo by the earthquake in chapter in chapter five. Um, so then Rousseau, who is uh, a Swiss thinker, uh, he he reads Voltaire's letter and is upset that Voltaire would essentially blame nature. Uh, and maybe even God for causing all these deaths. Voltaire, uh, Rousseau argued that if people had lived uh, closer to nature in small huts scattered across the Iberian Peninsula and not in large crowded five cities with five story buildings like Lisbon, uh, they wouldn't have died. So it was human beings and civilization that was a problem. So in a way, the earthquake helped both thinkers to kind of develop ideas that were already there. Um, and and were reflected in their later work. You know, Rousseau continued to to take the side of nature uh, and true humanity, not civilization, which had corrupted people. And Voltaire had no problem, you know, attacking nature and and indirectly God and railing against uh, human beings. So was it a major break anywhere in Europe? No. Um, but but it certainly um, it certainly led to an explosion of interest in geology uh, and in in these larger questions about God and nature uh, and in in a way the earthquake reveals the mind of the middle of the Enlightenment to to us uh, and that that's one of the things it does at least from the scholarly perspective but does it sort of change everything is it a major break um, no I, I would say. Mm -hmm. Do we know why exactly in the Russian Empire everyone was so interested in debating and discussing the event? Because as far as I understood from your lecture, not every country really covered it that much in their periodicals. Why Why the Russian Empire was interested? Oh, oh yeah, maybe I, 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 um, I misspoke. So, no, no, most countries were interested in the earthquake. Um, you know, across Europe. I mean, I read the, the German speaking newspapers. I read all the, as many as I could, the Italian newspapers. Um, I read the newspapers in the American colonies. So there's a couple of newspapers in Boston and I, and you can trace the news going north to south, Boston to New York, uh, down to Philadelphia. It's not published in the Virginia newspaper because apparently that those months uh, that that newspaper in Virginia was suspended because of Indian attacks along the borders. So so it was it was of interest uh, to um, to Europeans, and so I would say the Russians were interested in in it because everybody everybody else was interested in it for the same reasons. It was a shocking event. Um, you know, tens of thousands of people had had obviously died, and you know the, the monarch and his wife and their children had had to escape their palace. And at least the rumor was, or the the apocryphal story is that you know they hadn't had food for for a day, and and um, and the Spanish ambassador had died, and it was um, it, it was you know natural human interest. Uh, in 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 events, and as as I've said, the, the the Russians were interested in politics. They were interested in the you know the British Empire, and so although Portugal um, was you know was in the British sphere, so it would have been it would have been uh, you know of interest to Russian 